My name is Ronit Cohen. I'm going to be talking about the intersectionality, the intersection of bisexuality and race. Um, I'm a bisexual woman of colour and a therapist, um, which may sound like quite a random selection of nouns. Um, intersectionality is a way of understanding me better. Um, by exploring how different parts of my identity interact and how they relate to oppression, domination or discrimination. We all have multiple identities and all their parts intersect and overlap. They give us power and privilege or cause us to experience social disadvantage and oppression. So let's look at some of my identities. I'm bisexual mixed race, Jewish, atheist, female, middle class, and have a mostly but not always invisible disability. The oppressions and discriminations I've experienced because of my identities are biphobia, racism, anti-Semitism, and sexism. I've even experienced Islamophobia when mistaken for a Muslim Arab. That happens a lot. I also experience internalized ableism in the form of shame and denial, which is connected to me being less, less able. I experience privilege for being middle class and nothing I can't deal with for being an atheist. <laughs> One person's experience of bisexuality isn't universal. There are other aspects of identity that intersect with sexual identity in important ways. Even within bisexual communities, some bisexuals can experience multiple discriminations that keep them away and invisible. So how does that work? Bisexual people of colour must integrate multiple and complex identities and deal with a dual or multiple minority status. They're often hidden within any communities they belong to, remaining invisible and marginalised. Each part of their racial, cultural or ethnic identity adds a daily oppression, for example racism or Islamophobia, being a member of a sexual minority sets them apart from the collective sense of identity that unites so many ethnic communities. They suffer multiple oppressions. They end up marginalised outside their racial and ethnic communities due to their race. They end up marginalised within their racial and, racial and ethnic communities because of their sexuality. <laughs> They end up marginalised by heterosexuals and gays and lesbians alike because of their bisexuality. And then they end up marginalised because of their race within the bisexual communities. So it's not difficult to see that the oppressions and social disadvantages that these intersections bring with them would add a significant amount of stress to anyone's life. Prejudice is far-reaching, it enables discrimination and unfair treatment and hate crimes ranging from harassment to violence. Structural or institutional racism and biphobia are often hidden in the small print, but their impact on people of colour and bisexuals is just as deep. The more identities and intersections, the more oppressions and social disadvantage on many different levels. And this is what it's like for bisexual people of colour. When you look at how relentless it is and how impossible it is to get away from it, you can identify the potential for trauma and the lack of safety and stress. When we talk about oppressions, it's not just about aggressions like outright displays of racism or biphobia. These are generally committed by a minority and frowned on in polite society. There are other hidden forms of oppression, 
microaggressions and institutional racism and biphobia. The most common form of oppression is microaggressions, brief everyday exchanges that send denigrated mes denigrating messages. Microaggressions aren't overt and deliberate acts of bigotry. That makes them that much more sinister because calling someone out on them often leads to accusations of oversensitivity. Microaggressions are everywhere and they are incessant. They are so embedded in our culture that we don't notice them unless they're directed at one of our identities. This enables us to ignore oppression and believe it doesn't exist. It's like being asked, where are you from? And when you say London, being asked, no, where are you really from? Very familiar. <laughs> and, or it's like when people of color are being rowdy, it's called rioting. And when white youth do the same thing, they're called exuberant. You see that in the press a lot. <laughs> so, yeah, it's very, very easy to find microaggressions everywhere. Now, the intersections of bisexuality and race bring with them their own unique stresses. When you're bisexual in a people of color community, you're less likely to have the freedom to stray from traditional gender role stereotyping. You're likely to be confronted with negative cultural perceptions of same sex relationships. And you even risk experiencing abuse related to your sexual orientation. When you're a person of color in a bisexual community, you could face racism or you might find yourself objectified by your same sex or other sex partners. As a bisexual person of colour, you face structural oppressions. Mental health services tend to be either informed about race and culture or about bisexuality, rarely about both. Bisexual social and support networks are often uninformed about race and culture so that whatever they have to offer excludes the experiences of bisexual people of colour. One mental health help and advice brochure created by a bisexual organisation advises people who are struggling to practise yoga. Have they ever stopped to consider how inaccessible yoga can be to most people of, of colour for a myriad of reasons? And this is just one of several suggestions. So here we have a help resource for bisexuals that doesn't take into account the reality of life for people of colour and thereby excludes them. This helps reinforce the idea among bisexual people of colour that bisexual services aren't for them. We're much better at dealing with stress if we have two important resources. A sense of having some control over our life and adequate social support. Intersecting oppressions and social disadvantages mean that bisexual people of colour have few resources, which means even higher stress. Bisexual people of colour have less social support because of rejection from the heterosexual people of colour and white communities, and from the lesbian and gay communities. But they also have less social support from the bisexual communities. Endemic racism means they have less control over their lives. So from the point of view of resources that help deal with stress, bisexual people of colour are much worse off. Now, a stark illustration of structural institutional oppression is that bisexuals as a group have only started being studied separately from gays and lesbians in more recent years. Once that happened, it transpired that bisexuals are not only worse off than heterosexuals when it comes to mental health, but they're also worse off than gays and lesbians. The reality is that bisexuals have a greater prevalence of depression, anxiety, alcohol misuse, drug misuse, suicidal ideation and suicides 
than lesbians, gay and heterosexual adults, as Meg John has already mentioned. When it comes to people of color, structural institutional oppression merges with all the other aggressions and microaggressions to form a complex reality where diagnosis, treatment and outcomes are significantly different from those experienced by their white counterparts. They're more likely to be diagnosed with mental health problems, more likely to be admitted to hospital for these problems, and their treatment is more likely to have a poor outcome. They're also more likely to disengage from mainstream mental health services, ending up socially excluded and with deteriorating mental health. There are many oppressions and social disadvantages at work here. And by sexual people of colour, they have the worst of two worlds. There isn't much data out there which in itself is telling. But if you consider the intersections, the oppressions and social disadvantage and how it all interacts, it's not likely to be a pretty picture. My anecdotal evidence is that bisexual people of colour I see in my practice invariably have much worse mental health issues than their white counterparts. When bisexual people of colour come to us for therapy, it's important to remember that neither sexuality nor race are pathological in themselves. It's the oppression, social disadvantage and exclusion that cause mental health issues. Unfortunately, it doesn't stop there. Institutional structural oppression reaches even deeper, leaving us with very few suitable ways in which to help bisexual people of colour with mental health issues. Psychological literature and training are almost exclusively heterosexual and white Western. Bisexuality isn't addressed in a meaningful or integrative way in counselling psychology. It isn't integrated into theory, research or training. There is no real understanding of the unique issues facing bisexuals. People of colour are rarely focused on, let alone bisexual people of colour. This often leads to a total lack of fit between therapist and client. We generally make assumptions that people from other cultural, ethnic and religious backgrounds can't possibly be bisexual, kinky or non-monogamous. In my experience, nothing could be further from the truth. But then how do these people find a therapist? The few bisexuality aware or sex positive therapists around won't necessarily be knowledgeable about non-white, non-Western cultural backgrounds. There is a real mismatch. The advice white Western therapists give will often not be appropriate for people of colour needs. While the likelihood of finding a bisexuality aware therapist within ethnic communities is very small. A client of mine who fits the above description and whose family is Muslim and very traditional was told by a London therapist that the only way to deal with her crippling anxiety was to come out to her parents. I hope you're as gobsmacked as I was. She later went for relationship therapy with a therapist from the same ethnic background for help with her non-monogamous and kinky relationships. The therapist assured her she was very open-minded. In reality, she was so awful that my client barely managed to remain in her seat until the end of the session. She never went back. We're a great fit. You might think we wouldn't be because I'm Jewish, but real life doesn't work that way. Besides, I'm also half Middle Eastern, one of the intersections I left off the list, so I'm very familiar with her cultural background. 
So what was wrong with the other two therapists besides the fact that, like most of us, they didn't get trained in these areas and had no way of filling the gaps? It's fairly obvious that they weren't looking at her intersections and only seeing her as having a single identity. Whichever identity they saw was what they related to, ignoring the role her other intersections play. For them, being one thing excluded all possibilities of being anything else, especially if in their mind it was a complete contradiction of the identity that was visible to them. How can we make sure we don't repeat the way in which these therapists so badly let down their client? We need to understand intersectionality and its effects. We have to recognize our own intersections. This will enable us to recognize our own oppressions and privileges so that we understand why life is the way it is for us and not assume that it is the same for the person sitting opposite us. We will have a better understanding of what is possible for them to do and what is impossible, what is easy and what is hard. Check your own culture. Being white and Western isn't the absence of culture or race or ethnicity. It is also a culture. Too many people make the mistake of assuming white and Western is a kind of baseline. When you do that, everything else becomes an other, foreign or strange. Understand how you are influenced by your own cultural assumptions and norms. This will help you not see something that is basically no different from just another culture as the only way. It will help you let go and be open to the fact that we all have valid ways of living our lives. It will stop you from prescribing solutions that fit your world, but won't fit a world different from yours. What can you do for your client? They need to build up whatever coping resources they can in order to help them deal with the oppressions and social disadvantages that come with their intersections. We can't change the world, but we can help them build some sense of control and mastery by focusing on smaller areas in their world where it is achievable and gradually building up from there. We can help them become more self-compassionate, increase their self-acceptance, reduce the self-attack that they internalize from their environment. Self-attack is a big issue for oppressed groups, as is evident from the high levels of depression, self-harm, suicidal ideation, and suicide. Learning to trust others and believe in your self-worth enough to dare ask for support is also a big step but an invaluable one for someone who survives with, with an almost non-existent network of support. And boundaries are always important. The hunger for acceptance can be so acute that mixed with little sense of self-worth, it's easy to set no boundaries for fear of losing what's on offer. There are so many different ways of being bisexual in a person of color. They're all valid and shouldn't be judged. We all need to listen, accept, and support. We as therapists need to empower our bisexual people of color clients to find the best way for them to maneuver the multiple oppressions and social disadvantages caused by their intersectionality. We need to help them be themselves in the best way for them, ensuring that whatever we do, it's the right thing for each intersection and the way it interacts with all the others. That's it.